Today, we'll be diving into the breastfeeding recommendations in the Diseases of Children by Dr. Tooley, published in 1913. For more on Dr. Tooley and parenting in the United States in 1913, check out the video linked at the top right corner. I cannot refrain from saying a word against the unnatural mother who refuses to nurse her infant from purely selfish reasons, that she may have more time for society or pleasure. No physician should be party to this or encourage it in any way, unless it can be plainly shown by the most careful examination that the milk is unsuited and beyond remedial measures. The very fact that artificially fed infants show so much greater rate of mortality than the breastfed infant is sufficient reason for advocating breastfeeding. No substitute has ever been found for normal mother's milk for the nourishment of the infant. Mother's milk contains the food elements, fat, sugar, protid, mineral water, and salts in the proportions best suited for its digestive capacity and nutrition. While they recognized the positive health benefits of breast milk for babies, they weren't entirely sure what it was composed of, not even agreeing on whether it was acidic or alkaline. However, they were beginning to understand its macronutrient components. The usually accepted analysis of mother's milk shows a composition of 3.5% fat, 6% sugar, and 1.5% proteins. He notes that there is a wide variation in the protein and fat content of the milk based on the time of day, though the sugar content remained the same. And they understood colostrum to be beneficial, but not exactly why. The infant should be put to the breast as soon as the mother has had a rest from her labor, as the colostrum, present in the breast before labor, is essential for its purgative effect on the child. Newborns usually lose weight in the first few days after birth while the mother's milk is established. More so today because mother and baby are often overhydrated after being hooked to constant saline drip through labor. Then as now, the weight loss is worrisome for parents and medical providers alike. Dr. Tooley recommends supplemental feeding. Before the milk comes, in order to prevent a too rapid loss of weight, there should be given at regular intervals a 2% solution of sugar of milk or even plain sterile water. In addition to the concerns over neonatal weight loss, after birth but before the mother's milk comes in, newborns may experience a starvation temperature. The accompanying charts indicate the condition which is frequently seen during the first days after birth, the second or third as the rule, in which there is a rise in temperature which subsides after the administration of an artificial feeding, or which will disappear as soon as the milk appears in the mother's breast. It is a phenomenon too infrequently noticed as the temperature of but few newborn babies is taken. While I was aware of the normal drop in weight in the few days between the birth and the milk coming in, I hadn't heard of this starvation temperature before. I wonder if it is beneficial for a newborn to have a bit of a fever after birth as, as a protection from infection. Pediatricians, nurses out there, please chime in if you know more about this. Primipara should be instructed in the proper method of putting the child to the breast and holding it while nursing. During the purpurium, the mother lying partly on her side, the baby is put to the breast so that it can readily grasp the nipple, which has been previously prepared, and one finger depresses the gland so that it will not press upon the nose and interfere with its breathing. The baby can either be supported upon the arm or lie flat upon the bed, the mother's arm being raised. He goes on to warn the importance of keeping the breast tissue away from the baby's nose with an anecdote on a newborn who suffocated while breastfeeding. Please remember this is 106 year old medical advice. We have no way to verify this claim. We do know that a baby can bury their nose in the breast while nursing and be just fine. They will unlatch and jerk their head back if their breathing becomes obstructed. They cannot continue to nurse if they cannot breathe. So please don't stress. As a routine, the mouth should be washed with boracic acid solution before and after each nursing before nursing to protect the mother's nipple, and after to remove any particles of milk remaining in the folds of mucous membrane. The development of thrush or sprue is an evidence of carelessness and neglect. To wash the newborn's mouth out, he recommends creating a swab using gauze soaked in the boracic acid solution and wrapped around the little finger, then gently and carefully swabbing the newborn's mouth, being careful not to rub too hard because any abrasion could become infected. 
In addition, the mother's nipple must be cleaned in the same manner before and after each nursing. If nursed every two hours during the first three days, the tugging and pulling on a flabby, empty breast results in an erosion or fissured nipple. The newborn feeding schedule is every six hours on the first day, every four hours on the second day, and every three hours on the third day, and then every two hours on the fourth or as soon as the milk comes in. After the milk comes, the nursing should be by schedule, every two hours during the day and every three hours at night, from 6 a.m. to 10 p.m. every two hours, and one or two nursings at night. Under no conditions should a baby be allowed to sleep with its mother. The danger of overlaying is great, as is the danger of the child nursing most of the night. This always results seriously to child's digestion. The child should nurse from one breast at each nursing, alternately, and should be satisfied in from 10 to 15 minutes. If it must be nursed from both breasts each time, and is unsatisfied when the nursing is finished, the quantity is inadequate for its needs. By regularity being established early, both the baby is trained to good habits and the breasts to secrete at regular intervals. Dr. Tooley believes that giving water to breastfed babies between nursings should be a rule, and strangely, that babies can tell time or have read his book to know that they only get 15 minutes for meals. A nursing mother should lead a perfectly normal, healthy life. Her diet should be generous and varied. There are practically no articles of diet which, if they agree with the mother, will cause the milk to disagree with the child. As this is a textbook for medical students or a reference for practicing doctors, it goes into a lot of scientific testing of breast milk to determine what might be going wrong with the breast milk itself when feeding problems arise. He discusses supervision of breastfeeding, and what it could accomplish to ensure the continuation of breastfeeding. Effectively, this is a time when physicians took the role of a medically trained lactation consultant. The problems they sought to correct were an increase of a too small supply, changing the character of the milk, either decreasing the proteins, increasing the fat, or decreasing the fat, making serviceable nipples out of flat and depressed ones, to supply an artificial or adjuvant food in case of a good but too small supply from the breasts, in other words, supplemental feeding, and to continue nursing should there be a superating mastitis, so relactation basically. A fissured or eroded nipple should not be nursed from directly, but protected by a nipple shield. And after each nursing session, the nipple should be painted with a solution of nitrate of silver, 20 grains to the ounce of water, care being taken to limit the application directly to the affected part. If you've had a baby with an umbilical granuloma, you may have seen your doctor use a silver nitrate stick, which looks like a big matchstick, to cauterize the stump with silver nitrate. So imagine putting that on your nipples when they're already cracked or <clears throat> eroded. There may be ample supply of good milk, but the absence of a serviceable nipple may prevent the child's obtaining it. Dr. Tooley recommends that doctors examine their patient's nipples early in pregnancy so that they can give instructions for the massaging and training of flat or inverted nipples to correct them. By massaging and training, a very serviceable nipple can be made from an unpromising one if the treatment is begun early enough. The wearing of tight corsets or clothing should be advised against during pregnancy, but especially in the presence of flat or depressed nipples. Low supply of breast milk is evidenced by the baby not gaining weight or even losing weight, or if the baby is crying within a few minutes after leaving the breast and sucking vigorously on its fists after nursing. Dr. Tooley recommends that the mother add more galactagogues to her diet, free drinking of milk, cocoa, or chocolate, and the cereal gruels. The gruels can be made of oatmeal, barley, or cornmeal and need to be cooked for several hours before serving with enough milk that they can be drunk or eaten with a spoon like a soup. No article of diet so stimulates the function of the gland as cow's milk, and in connection with the cereals, excellent results are seen. Unfortunately for you beer lovers out there, he strongly advises against them. As they encourage the secretion of milk with a deficiency in its life-giving properties and an increase in the watery element. It was recognized that certain medications could be passed through the breast milk. Opium, belladonna, cascara, 
mercury, iodides, bromides, and salicylates. Though he doesn't think that it's a reason to stop breastfeeding, to stop or to stop taking the drugs, or an efficient means of deploying these medications to the infant. The elimination of drugs in the milk is not sufficiently certain or exact to employ this method of medication in infants, nor enough to remove the child from the breast, or if any of these drugs were indicated in the mother. Colic has been reported since antiquity. In the West, it has always been assumed to be associated with tummy troubles. In 1913, the new theory was that too much protein or proteids in the breast milk was the cause and maternal exercise was the treatment. A too high percentage of proteids is evidenced by colic, crying with a doubling up of the legs, tense abdomen, or green stools containing mucus and curds. This often occurs during the purpurium, but as soon as the mother gets up and is able to take the proper exercise, the increased proportion of proteids is generally decreased. In addition to getting exercise, Dr. Truly recommends that the foremilk be pumped and dumped and the baby fed only on middle milk and strippings. This of course doesn't make sense given the excess protein theory as the middle milk and strippings, as he calls it, would have the greater percentage of protein compared to the foremilk. Taking the child from the breast before it has finished nursing and giving it a small quantity of barley water, previously dextrinized, from a bottle will often relieve the colic, lessen the diarrhea, and make the curds smaller. While as a general rule it may be stated that the ideal food is a healthy breast milk, this is not always the case, for not infrequently a mother has an abundant supply but secretes a milk which is unsuited to the needs of her own baby. In his opinion, there are but few contraindication to maternal nursing. These include a severely inverted nipple, mothers with tuberculosis, malignant disease, diphtheria, rheumatism or chorea, acute contagious diseases and pneumonia, erysipelas, which is a skin infection, albuminoria, which is associated with kidney disease, typhoid fever, as the typhoid bacillus is excreted in the breast milk, the acute exanthamida, which is the skin eruptions associated with scarlet fever, chickenpox, smallpox, measles, and rubella, pregnancy occurring during lactation, epilepsy or nephritis, or if the mother has suffered from purpural hemorrhage, nephritis, eclampsia, or infection. Please note that this, is, this medical advice is 106 years old and not reflective of modern medical recommendations. If you have questions about whether or not you should breastfeed, ask your doctor. Throughout the section on infant feeding, Dr. Tooley makes clear that it's not an all or nothing deal. He recommends combined feeding when possible. If it is apparent that a child is not gaining rapidly while nursed exclusively, by giving one or two artificial feedings a day of modified cow's milk, very good results can frequently be obtained. For babies who are getting supplementary formula in addition to breast milk, the recommendation is for the night feedings, if any, to be breast milk, for convenience sake. The only objection to this is the possibility of the mother falling asleep and allowing the child to lie with a nipple in its mouth for several hours at a time. In premature infants with no maternal milk supply, or where sudden weaning from any cause becomes imperative, a wet nurse should be obtained. The considerations for employment of a wet nurse include her age, the age and weight of her infant, her general health, development, and general surroundings, tuberculosis and syphilis positively excluded, and the breast milk examined. He recommends that the diet of the wet nurse must not be changed because lack of exercise may change the character of her milk entirely. While manual breast pumps and hand expression of breast milk were done at the time, it wasn't exactly practical for regular feeding. It's not as though they had the means to keep the breast milk fresh. So when bottle feeding is discussed, it is with formula or water in mind. Dr. Tooley recommends that a breastfed baby be introduced to the bottle when a few weeks old, just one bottle feeding a day to accustom it to the bottle. To enable the mother to have a few extra hours of recreation occasionally if the demand arises. You can see more on Dr. Julie's bottle recommendations, including brands and types to avoid, as well as their cleaning and care in the video linked above. So what did you think about Dr. Julie's breastfeeding recommendations? Do you have any family stories about feeding babies from this time period? In the videos in this series, I'll also be covering formula feeding, the certified milk movement, and weaning. Subscribe to make sure that you know when they're posted. 
And if you enjoy this kind of research, please hit the like button and share. It will really help me grow this channel, and if you would like to help support The Baby Historian, check out my Patreon page. Patrons get behind the scenes info on my research and previews of upcoming videos. If you have an idea for a video topic, please leave a comment below or contact me on Facebook, Instagram, or Twitter. Thanks for watching! That is not an actual phrase in English. What? I think I did the... The elimination of drugs in the milk is not sufficiently certain or exact to employ this method of medication in infants, nor enough to remove the child from the breast for, if any of these drugs were indicated in the mother. What is... That guy's on drugs, if whoever wrote this. <laughs>